I've, I've never seen anything quite like this. There's been such a slowed response. I mean, the train derailment happened, what, February 3rd? You know, Norfolk took over at that point and any and all information that was coming out and what was going on, they hemmed and hauled for days. They dug a big hole, unwind. They bled out all the liquid chemicals into that hole. Then they lit it on fire, which is very concerning. A, you just now really set it up to contaminate an entire aquifer for decades. And then you light a volatile compound like vinyl chloride on fire that creates dioxins and it just rains out on the community. And there's a window where nobody seems to know anything or talking about it. No agencies in particular are showing up. Where is the federal EPA? It was being handled very unusually. And the people, which is my biggest concern, were in total frustration in a very conflicted message. Evacuate, safe to come back, shouldn't drink the water, you can drink the water, everything's fine, there's no problem. And it's like these people lived and experienced this moment and they're still suffering from it, they're still sick from it, and they're terrified for their future. And nobody can seem to really give them an honest answer about what happened, what's going to happen to them, and what to expect. I was getting emails as early as 4.50 a.m. on the 4th from the community. There's a train. There's been a train derailment. It's on fire. Uh, there's chemicals in it. What's happening? What should we do? And it just built and escalated from there to, you know, the community really said, please, we would like your advice. We would like you to come in. What should we do? These people are frightened, uncertain what's going to happen. There's been chemicals involved, a train derailment. And so that is my first response is for them. Oftentimes that requires us coming out and having a town hall meeting. There is so much information to be giving these people, not only about what happened. And we have kind of a teaching moment here, if you will, because agencies have been handling over and over and over again, these environmental disasters kind of in the same way. All is clear. Everybody go home. It's forgotten about it. But oh, oops, five, 10 years in the future, we have a huge contamination. Chemicals that are associated with cancers. The community is sick. We have a moment here now moving forward how much information these people need. This is going to be groundwater monitoring for decades. This will be soil vapor intrusion monitoring for decades. It should be the monitoring of the public health and the welfare and their future. So it's not like this is one and done. What's happened to their homes, their property values? Can they grow their food? And so we've talked about it over the past few days. I don't even like to, to make a, a correlation here, but 9-11, when all those towers came down, all those chemicals that spilt out, everybody knew, oh my gosh, what have we inhaled? What are we breathing? What's our future? But it was supposedly safe. And here we are today dealing with all these problems. This can be prevented. And that's what I would like us to start focusing on. We're going to have to help build back and repair this community and keep them in close watch because nobody, and it's a misinformation if anyone tells you it's safe today and it will be fine tomorrow. That's just not how these situations work out. What's safe today is probably going to be contaminated tomorrow. And this isn't a one fix. Um, this is going to be years and decades in the making of following up, monitoring, and stopping the contamination they've caused. How far it will go still needs to be found out. And what, most importantly, we can do for these people and how they will be monitored in the future. Yeah, I'm so concerned about these environmental issues. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. And the same thing happened when I worked out in that small desert town and in every other town that I am across America. And here we are today. We have to look at a deeper systemic issue. We have to look at how we're handling these environmental issues. We can't afford to kick the can down the line. We can't afford to sweep it under the rug. I think that we really have to start looking at our aged out infrastructure. That means railroads, our piping, our water, all of it. So there is a deep issue here that we can't afford, whether you're a company or our government, to continue to kick a can down the line. We're going to have to stop and take that fork in the road and how we move forward and become more preventative, more proactive, and not just reactive once the disasters occurred. It's called the canary in the mine shaft. Send the canary right. down there, it dies, might not be good for humans. You have dead fish, might not be good for humans. You have dead animals, might not be good for humans. You've sent a horrible mixed message to this community. Drink the water, don't drink the water. Safe, not safe. It's, it's horribly confusing and extremely frustrating to them. And something actually has gone wrong here. And there's information that has yet to come forward. And the story will continue to unfold. I, that's so nicely put. And I just want to pick up on something you said. The wellheads have been locked. What did you mean? So, so in the schools, uh, so the children can't drink the fountains. And then yep. on private wells around here, they've got locks on them. So they obviously, uh, uh, come on, if there's yep. no problem, you don't need to lock a, a, a drinking fountain. You don't need to be aerating the system. And you can explain the way all day long to me that nothing's wrong, but I, I, I see what's going on here. I want you to know that there's a lot of Norfolk employees that are coming forward with information that is extremely valuable. And the Railroad Workers United wants to say they condemn what's happened, and they are coming out in support of you about what they know and who should be accountable for this incident and how it happened. 
So my biggest message, and I, I would stay here all night and talk with you, but I'm afraid that the mic is going to go off again, or the lights are going to go off again. And there are some people here tonight, and we came together to give you information. Information of what we've learned about the water. Information to share with you, to understand the water. Look, I've seen the videos where they drank the water, the city water, and everything was safe. It's hard for you all to believe that when the day before it wasn't, and then the next day it is. But please understand, in that moment, it might have been safe. But tomorrow, that might not be the circumstance. And this is what we've learned over and over again. These chemicals take time to move in the water. You're going to need medical water monitoring, groundwater monitoring. People on well water, you really need to be on alert. They're going to need to implement soil vapor intrusion modeling. Believe us, it's coming. You have a high water table, you've got volatile organics on the top. As it moves underneath homes, it can vaporize. You need to be vigilant, you need to journal, you need to document information. So I won't be talking about that because we want you to get information that you can take home so you're better informed, so you have a better understanding. We're not going to have all the answers for you, but we're going to provide information about what your legal rights are or aren't what you need to do. Information, water, these types of environmental contaminations aren't just a sound bite for a news story. It's an actual story. Oh my god! Okay. Thank you. I'll keep talking on with more of that. Okay. We're all good? Sabotage. Okay, but I'm going to keep talking. No, I'm not going to pay attention to the lights. So, um, I'm going to be introducing somebody here. And look, this is not the last time I'm going to be here. And I'm, I'm so sorry for what has happened and all the confusion. But I do want to give you assurance that there is forward movement. But until you know all the information, all the facts, and some of the things you might hear tonight are going to scare you. But I have learned, and communities know, give me that worst case scenario. Because if I don't know what that is, I can't make plans, and I can't be prepared, and I can't protect myself in the absence of an agency or a company doing the right thing by you and your family. So with that, something very simple that I have heard from you, I have been emailed by you, and that is, you are now the eyes and the ears. This is what's happened to you. It will be your narrative. And don't let anyone knock you off that game of what in fact has happened to you. I'll never forget when I started in Hinkley, and it actually happened to me here. Actually, it happens to me all the time. Hey, why are you here? You're not a doctor. You're not a lawyer. You're not a scientist. So wait, what would you know? Go away. Well, I'll tell you, that happened to me 31 years old in Eastern California. And I was stunned. And I said, let me tell you something right now. I don't have to be any of that. To be a human and to tell you those three-headed frogs and that green water is messed up and I'm saying something. And every one of you in this room knows what happens, knows what you experienced, knows what you've gone through, you understand the fear, and don't let anyone else tell you what happened to you or how you feel, in fact, didn't happen. And that's concerning me here. All of a sudden, it's, we sound, it's all safe. We're all done with this, and everyone moves on. And then the community becomes forgotten. In Hinkley, California, and I started that case in 1991, that contaminant hit their aquifer in 1958. It is still contaminated Today, PG&E has had to buy up everybody off of their land, and they are still other and under another 50-year cleanup. In Flint, Michigan, was that five years ago, Melissa? Six? Nine. Nine. Almost. Still today, 
They are still fighting for information. They're still fighting to get service lines in, and people are still drinking water contaminated with lead. We still see ongoing effects from the BP oil spill. In Leroy, New York, where they had a train derailment decades ago, we were up there about eight years ago. A group of the girls are getting sick, and we find out still the groundwater and the well water is contaminated today. There is a moment here for this community and for all of us, and it's a teaching moment. We cannot afford agency or company to continue to kick the can down the line and ignore a deeper issue that's going on. We've got failing infrastructure, companies with poor corporate models that cut maintenance, that put all of us at risk and continue to just think, once we poison the community, it's just gonna magically go away. We often find out five and 10 years down the road after you were told it was safe. Oh, oops, Houston, we have a problem. There is actually a moment here with this community rising up, and you have been, that we can take a different turn, a different track, if you will, a better message, and start dealing with our environmental issues, start dealing with our failing infrastructure, start giving information to people so we can better protect our health. I was born and raised in Lawrence, Kansas. I feel like I am at home, and I mean that. And what I was brought up to believe, and what I know, and that I know you know, the greatest gifts we have, and we can have all the political arguing you want, but for every one of us, it is our water, it is our land to grow our food, it is our health, and it is us and we the people. Ready, please? This is Michael Watts. So before I started, they said, I want you to use this mic. And I said, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> it, it works. So this is good. I'm Michael Watts, um, and I'm really sorry to have to be here. Um, and I'm really sorry that you're experiencing what you're experiencing. It must have been terrifying. And my job is to not tell you what you want to hear. My job is to tell you uh, the information as it is. And so I want to give you the good and the bad and the ugly of the situation in which you find yourself, uh, both from the standpoint of what I would call a court of public opinion, which you can expect in a court of law if there's litigation. Uh, but before we start, I just want to make some observations. Um, the hazard of train derailments, while it may be new to this community, uh, it is not a new phenomenon. It's been happening for well over a century. Um, this hazard is the direct result of maintenance choices and inspection choices and dollars to fund maintenance and inspection or dollars withheld to fund maintenance and inspection so that you can pay corporate compensation to your executives, buy back stock, and the like. And so the amount of money that's being budgeted for things the railroads know they have to do has a direct relationship with whether these events happen. So how long have we known about the hazard of derailments? At least a century. And I just want to show you a couple of examples. In Guadalajara, Mexico in 1915, during the U.S.-Mexican War, and right after, 600 people died. In 1917, in Romania, during World War I, 800 people died. In France, another troop carrier derailed. 800 people died. Moving up to World War II, in Italy, in Balvano, Italy, 500 people died. Moving up to the 1980s, in Bihar, India, 500 deaths. Train derailment is an expedited trip to the next life if there's a, de a derailment. It is a shockingly dangerous phenomenon, and so the duty to prevent it in the law should be higher. Now, you're seeing a lot of things that that's in other countries. I mean, over in Ethiopia, how do they know how to build a train track? Well, they build them just like we do. And unfortunately, we maintain ours a lot like they do. 425 deaths in 1985. Recently in Russia, in 1989, 575 deaths. 
It's a hazard that has been known consistently for more than a century. But I can show you any examples in the United States. Maybe that's just a problem that other people have. We don't have that here in the United States until 2023, right? No. The train derailment hazard is a hazard that is well known here in the United States. Let me just give you five examples in the last 30 something years. And I started in 1991 because that's when Aaron started picking on PG&E in Hinkley, California. 19,000 gallons of herbicide dumped into the river in Dozmere, California. In 1992, up in Superior, Wisconsin, 15,000 gallons of benzene, which we're going to talk about in a bit, right? This happened 31 years ago. In North Dakota, 146,700 gallons of ammonia. In Paulsboro, New Jersey, 23,000 gallons of something that you are now familiar with. Vital chloride. We're going to talk again about this one because the railroad that operated the train that derailed, I mean, that, that jumped the tracks, it was the same railroad that was operating the train that derailed in your town. In the law, this is what we call notice, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail. More recently, in 2015, it says deaths, and it should say gallons, I apologize, but acolytes, all sorts of hazardous chemicals. We live in a society, for better or worse, that chooses to ship the most deadly, the most toxic, the most dangerous chemicals ever made by man in rail cars right through populated cities. Now, whether that's a good choice or not is not for me to say. But if you are going to ship these kinds of chemicals through populated areas or small towns like this, you damn sure have an obligation to make sure that you don't jump the tracks. Prior Norfolk Southern train derailments, is this their first rodeo to quote Miss Rockefish? No. Let me just talk to you about four or five. In 2002, in Tennessee, 10,600 gallons of sulfuric acid were released after this company derailed a the train there. In 2012, in Polesboro, New Jersey, 23,000 gallons of vinyl chloride were released after a derailment on a bridge in New Jersey. 2018, in Pennsylvania, 46 double stack cars, 23 well cars jumped the tracks. Fortunately, in that one, they were carrying Listerine and campers. And of course, what just happened to you, 1.1 million pounds of vinyl chloride had to be released within days of this to keep your town from exploding. What happened to you is not new. What happened to you is a hazard that has been known by this company for a long time. And what happened to you is a course of conduct that is repetitive, entirely preventable, but not prevented. I asked the question to my staff in preparing for this, has anyone ever died from a train derailment? In Norfolk Southern's prior train derailment, so one of my law geeks went on something called Westlaw, it's like Google for lawyers. And we looked up all the cases involving Norfolk Southern that were reported, a bunch of cases in all jurisdictions, 623 derailments made it to the appellate courts. And then of all those 623, we were looking for experts and we looked at all that. But one thing that we did find in looking and reading all these cases, and I've read every one of them, is this. There was a history of reported cases, and we came across this one from a decade ago in Paulsboro, New Jersey. And the reason this is important to me is when you dig up the case, you'll find a case called Scott versus a whole bunch of companies with Norfolk Southerns in there. And what happened in that case? The claims arise from exposure to the chemical vinyl chloride following a trade derailment on the East Jefferson Street Bridge over the Mantua Creek in Paulsboro, New Jersey on November the 30th of 2012. Plaintiff Michael Hardy and decedent Wesley Hardy were residents of New Jersey at the time of the incident. The decedent was working in her yard at the time of the incident. She was admitted to the hospital due to difficulty breathing, chest pains, burning, and irritation of the eyes. Familiar to anyone? And she passed away four days later. This is, in the practice of law, what we call notice. You killed somebody a decade ago because your choices allowed one of your trains that you were responsible for.
to jump the tracks while you were carrying one of the worst chemicals ever invented by mankind. So what did you do about it to prevent it from happening again? Well, they got sued. They got insurance. They settled the case. Insurance pays for it. What did they do? I don't know whether they sent flowers to Miss Hardy's funeral, but there she is. Her death was unnecessary, and what happened to your town was unnecessary as well. They had a decade to prevent it from happening again. Then I asked the question, well, do we have any statistics as to how often this happens to Norfolk Southern? And it turns out that the Transportation Administration, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and you saw its administrator here yesterday, has a rail equipment accident incident database. And you can go in and you can type Norfolk Southern as my law lawyer, my partner Jay Henderson, who's here. And one of these things, he just looked for 20 years from 2003 to 2022, and it says that Northern Suffolk, Norfolk Southern reported 3,397 events that were classified as a derailment. Start doing the math, folks. 3,397 events classified as a derailment over 20 years. This is happening about every three days. It's not always catastrophic, but the data does not lie. So what did Norfolk Southern do to prevent derailments before this one? Well, we know that last year in 2022, they had 770 cars carrying hazardous materials that were involved in accidents, up from just 79 cars in 2012. How is that possible? An almost tenfold increase it says the year before should be from 2012. But the bottom line is in the last decade, since poor Ms. Hardy was killed by exposure to vinyl chloride, their accident rate has gone up almost tenfold. Why? Well, we know they've got plenty of money because they're spending $10 billion buying back their own stock, which is what companies do when they're too flush with cash and they want to raise the stock price. They just buy it back. There's been a lot of study or articles about the relationship between Norfolk Southern's profit motives and more accidents. And the bottom line is when you look at the data, safety experts are saying this focus on financial returns may be partly to blame for the derailments and accidents like the one in Ohio. And we've got data with respect to hazmat cars, which are in green. We've got releases, and you can see it's persistent. It's not frequent, but it's persistent. And then the profits and the corporate bonuses keep getting paid as the maintenance budgets are trimmed. They have to file as a publicly traded corporation something known as a report on 10K. It's the annual report to the shareholders. And in effect, we can see what their net income is in 2022, 21, 20. And just in the two years since 2020, their income has gone up by 62%. That does not happen by accident. That is a function of corporate planning at the highest levels of the company. How much they're gonna spend on maintenance, how much they're gonna spend on inspections, how much they're gonna spend on technology, or not. They saved enough money to buy back $10 million of their own stock recently. So what happened on February the 3rd of 2023? You know, I drove to Canton to meet with some lawyers on this earlier today, and we came through the town of Salem, Ohio. You know where it is. It's not far from where this derailment was, but it's, it's plenty up the track. And this company, Utech Bliss, had a surveillance video that a lot of you all have seen. And I'm not playing the videos because they tend to eat it up, but you can see flames. <laughs> as this car number 23 is going by. And so the bottom line is, is that we start to see those flames well before this ever comes to New York town. And you might have the question, what the hell is a train going on fire? <laughs> Fires on trains happen as a result of a hot axle and plastic pellets in the rail guard. Says Ms. Emily, who is the chair of the NTSB, who in my view is to be congratulated for getting a preliminary report out within three weeks so we know what the heck was going on. So you have the fire, there it is. Make it a little bigger and fuzzier, there it is. 
miles up the track. Now, I know every little boy wanted to be a train conductor, but as an old man, I am confused how it is in 2023 technology that the crew could go mile after mile after mile without knowing that one of his cars is on fire. And we'll have to talk about that. But as we look at what happened, the NTSB report that came out yesterday, as you, if you've read it, there are detectors along the track that detect the temperature of these cars to see if anything is elevated. And we can see that at Malco 79.9, the suspect bearing from the 23rd car had a recorded temperature 38 degrees above ambient temperature. And then at 69.01, it was 103 degrees Fahrenheit over ambient temperature. And then finally, 253 degrees before somebody told him with an alarm, it's time to stop the train. Leading to the very obvious question, is that a good thing to be 103 degrees above ambient temperature without an alarm? But they set the alarm at 117, so the crew never got a warning until the third heat indicator had it at 253. So the wayside defect detector, or the hot bearing detector, transmitted a critical audible alarm message instructing the crew to slow down and stop the train to inspect the hot axle. So we still have time to prevent what's happened to you. But now we got another problem on the way to the play. Another maintenance issue. When they apply the brakes, there's a little problem. The train comes to a stop after the acceleration from the auto automatic emergency brake application. Then the crew gets out and they notice that there's smoke and notify the Cleveland Eats dispatcher of a possible derailment. Now, Mama didn't raise the smartest kid, but my, my common sense says, how does a crew not know that they derailed? Five derailed DOT 105 uh, specification tank bars. 28, 31, and 55 carrying 115,580 gallons of vinyl chloride continued to concern authorities because of the temperature inside one tank car was still rising, thus she had the automatic or the, 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 the intentional release of all this stuff. The initial fire was the result of the hot axle and the plastic pellets in the rail car. And so here we are, eventually it's 253 degrees Fahrenheit above the ambient temperature. I've learned from coming from the south, it gets cold here. But even if it was 40 degrees, we're boiling water temperature above the temperature in terms of what this was. It was well above critical levels. The chair of the NTSB says had there been a detector earlier, the derailment may not have occurred. Now, crew receives a warning telling them to immediately slow and stop the train to conduct an inspection. During the deceleration, the rail car wheel bearing failed, maintenance problem number two, causing the derailment. The NTSB's got all this equipment, the wheel set, the bearing, there are various causes of roller bearings to overheat, including fatigue cracking, water damage, and mechanical damage. All things that you see if you have a proper inspection program. All things that you miss if you choose not to pay for inspections, and choose to send those dollars up to corporate executives for stock buybacks. You know the result. There were 38 cars derailed and fire damaged, an additional, 100, an additional 12 cars, according to the NTSB. And you've seen the pictures. <laughs> and again, I am so sorry that this. Now, I don't know if this if they have to take additional precautions due to traveling with hazardous waste and whether or not those precautions were or were not taken. That's what I'm hearing about this case, is that they that this is something that they were trying to cut money by transporting these things that are hazardous waste in a way that perhaps maybe they shouldn't have been transported that way, or maybe the regulation should be different. I don't know for... if it's even hazardous waste, though. I think it's just chemicals that we use in plastic. So it's very hazardous. It's not waste. Right. Uh, hazardous materials. Right, right. It's very yeah. hazardous material. I don't think it's, it's, it's like a byproduct. Yeah. No, it's ha it's very dangerous materials. But that's why there's this one kid, Nick Drum, who's been doing these amazing TikToks that I'm obsessed with because it's that he's like a chemist. Yes. He, and he's great. He's great. He's actually taking what the APA is releasing, and he's trying to make sense of it. And he's like, why am I 
<laughs> the person who's doing this. Yeah. Why am I the person who's asking these questions? Because what he mentions is when you look at the manifest of the chemicals that were on there, why what we're looking at is this, they're doing, you know, what's in the air. But also he was saying there was petroleum. So we're talking about an oil spill, too, but no one's talking about that. Well, let's play what he has to say. Rewind that. So let's talk about the trail derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. East Palestine's about an hour north of Pittsburgh, almost halfway to Cleveland. Norfolk Southern has a rail line that goes right through town, and this derailment happened right on the edge outside of town on the border of PA and Ohio. Of the cars that crashed, five of them contain vinyl chloride. It's a monomer used to make PVC. People that are reporting on this has gotten vinyl chloride confused with polyvinyl chloride, the polymer made out of vinyl chloride. Now, the reason that this distinction is really important is vinyl chloride is very hazardous and very flammable. Polyvinyl chloride is a plastic that's used in, like, everything. Another thing about vinyl chloride is that it boils at 8 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's shipped in its liquid form. Meaning that when these trains crashed and these started leaking, they weren't just leaking liquid, but they were spewing boiling gas. So vinyl chloride is really toxic. OSHA has the permissible limit of how much you can be exposed to it during an 8 hour shift as a 1 ppm part per million average over eight hours. So prior to this, the biggest spill of this chemical was in New Jersey, where one train car and about 23,000 gallons of vinyl chloride were spilled, but it can catch on fire. Now, this crash in Ohio has five train cars. These kinds of tanker cars can carry between 25 and 33,000 gallons. Let's call it 250 to 250,000 pounds of vinyl chloride. That's per train car, five train cars. There's maybe a million pounds of this toxic chemical spilling into the ground and also boiling off into the air. But then it caught on fire. I think this is where the reporting is really bad because no one is mentioning what the byproduct of vinyl chloride burning is. Of the many byproducts of burning vinyl chloride, one of them is hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen chloride is really unstable and latches onto water, like just water vapor in the atmosphere, and that turns into hydrochloric acid. So right now, government officials, officials from the railroad, both the governor of Pennsylvania and Ohio are calling burning off the million pounds of this stuff a success, but not mentioning that it means that we have hundreds of thousands of pounds of acid in the air, potentially. Now, ever since engineering school, I've studied a lot of industrial accidents. I just find it really fascinating, and organizations like the Chemical Safety Board, NTSB, and OSHA all have like really good reports available to the public. I think as a designer, it's really good to learn about mistakes. When looking at these kinds of industrial disasters across time, there are a couple things that are pretty universal across all of them. One, the responsible party in this case, Norfolk Southern Railway, always plays down the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. Politicians also just repeat the same lines, and then news outlets just repeat the same. So all we are hearing is the responsible party's word. This hasn't been getting... So, Jamie, I also sent you a video that shows what it looks like in the area where these clouds are passing over, and it is horrific. It's apocalyptic. It's so terrible. There's a man who's on the ground who's screaming that these aren't storm clouds. This, these are the clouds that of this shit that they're burning from East Palestine. And he's freaking out, and, you know, like animals are dying pets are dying fish are dying in the rivers it's it, the idea that they only evacuated a small area yeah like, you're talking about like miles and miles away from this yeah animals are dying. this is it look at this play this go full screen with this because it's so these great. aren't look these aren't this. storm clouds this is a fucking ship that they burn off the fucking shit they burn off in east palestine this is not fucking storm clouds look at this i know look at it this is over darlington this is fucking insane it's if you insane. if you're just listening what we're looking at is just intense black clouds covering this area and it, it's daytime yeah and you can't see shit you, you the sky is completely covered in black play give me the volume yeah, from East Palestine they're fucking controlled burn yeah, it's the idea is a controlled up. burn is so crazy. Well, I guess because they were worried that it was going to explode. That's why they felt they had to burn it. But it did explode, right? Didn't no, it they were fire? felt it was going to be a massive explosion. And this would have happened anyway. But I mean, there's no other option. And they, they like in one of that kid's TikToks like, later on, he talks about how they just buried it. And so people are saying they did this just to get the trains running again, basically. Mm -hmm. Which again, the cynic in me wouldn't doubt. But I don't know. I just sent you a text from. Um, my editor, Joe Donatelli, who I love from Playboy, he now lives in Ohio and he's on, does local news. And I will say local news has been great on this. 
they are actually reporting. And he, like he said to me, you have to be able to like muster the resources, fact check things. It, it isn't as fast as the internet where there's a void of information that gets filled. And right. he did a long thread about what they've learned in his, at the local news station where he is that's really good and I recommend people go check it out because I think local news is actually pretty good on this but some people in Ohio are saying they didn't even know about it 